Well, thanks for all coming. Um, first, a personal note. I got started on this uh, working for Attorney General Lefkowitz in New York State in 1974, um, investigating shipments of plutonium out of Kennedy Airport. They were actually shipping liquid plutonium out of Kennedy Airport and uh, in containers that were designed to withstand a 30-foot drop. Uh, so we took the, the Attorney General took uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to court. Uh, it was our opinion, uh, oh thanks, uh, it was our opinion that uh, this was unsafe, uh, that planes fly higher than 30 feet, uh, but the NRC uh, disputed that, uh, I don't know how, and eventually, eventually, uh, by 1980, uh, Congress passed an appropriations bill that said you have to design these uh, plutonium containers so they could withstand an air crash, just like black boxes on airplanes uh, can withstand an air crash, and they did. Uh, I only mention this story because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't have all the answers, okay? You have to feel, when you ask a question and there's a table full of suits, uh, they don't necessarily have all the answers to your questions. And they didn't have it in, uh, when we talked about plutonium uh, flying out of Kennedy Airport. Another example is in 1976, I gathered together four engineering students, and this is how I got started on uh, decommissioning. I gathered four engineering students at SUNY Buffalo, where I was teaching, and I don't know what got into me. I said, we should go look at what's happening at some of these experimental reactors that they're closing down, like the Elk River reactor. Uh, and we looked at it and we saw that, uh, well, there's some radionuclides that look like they're long lived. Uh, and it doesn't look like what the industry says, that we can just entomb the reactor and wait for 300 years and then just take it apart. It doesn't look like that is true. Uh, so we published a paper on that and got tremendous heat. You know, it was almost like you know, being on a diving board and leaping off and hoping there's water in the pool. Uh, we got a tremendous heat from the, the engineering department, the nuclear engineering department. But, and uh, I'm sure Arjun would agree about this, the industry never tells you you're right. You know, when you, when you uh, are right. But in 1982, Science Magazine said we changed the entire course of decommissioning in the country uh, because no, they are no longer talking about entombing reactors. Now it's either safe store, 60 years, not 300, or dis immediate dismantlement of reactors. Uh, that's just another example I've learned. Uh, you just don't take you know, authority. You can ask questions, they don't necessarily have all the answers. I'm going to give a general outline of where is the radioactivity in a, in a reactor that's decommissioned, what kind of exposures could you get if you were actually, you know, in contact with this material, <coughs> uh, what is going to happen in the future at uh, San Onofre? I'm going to give a general overview. This is decommissioning 101. There you go. Oh, oh good. Oh, you recognize it now. <laughs> this was going to have me talk about Mitsubishi uh, and their failed uh, steam generators. OK. Uh, this is a pressure water reactor. I can talk with this. Uh, 
hot water under pressure, pressure water reactor, uh, goes to a steam generator. All this isn't to scale. The steam generators are going to be much larger in this picture. Uh, steam generator then generates steam in, an, in a separate loop. Uh, you're not supposed to have a leak from this side over to this side. <laughs> but that's what was happening with the Mitsuji Mitsubishi steam generator. Holes were forming in the steam generator tubing and some radioactive material was getting from this cycle over to this over here. Whoops. Oh, good. As you get closer to a nuclear, to nuclear fission, and assume that there's a reactor in here, uh, the radioactivity levels go higher. Uh, and here, one is this, what's called the biological shield. Uh, and the radioactivity levels I have there are 36 curies per cubic meter. And the levels on the inside of the concrete are on the order of two to four rems per hour. It, a rem is, well, background radiation is on the order of 0.1 rem per hour, per year. Okay, so this is two to four rems per hour on the inside of this biological shield. When they eventually take apart the reactor, which is inside here, they'll fill this with water and do that all uh, with, with water shielding. Whoops. Then when you get closer into the reactor itself, when you're out in this vessel, when the inner cladding, there you're talking about 1.5 thousand curies per cubic meter. And you're talking about higher radiation levels. When you get into the thermal shield here, then you're talking about 0.15 million curies per cubic meter. And the radiation field is on the order of, the dose rates are on the order of 80,000 rems per hour. And finally, when you get into the shroud, which is, which is this li line right here, then you're talking about 3 million curies per cubic meter, over 600,000 uh, rems per hour. And all that has to be taken apart and it has to be taken apart with uh, water shielding. The dose rates decline very slowly. Well, they decline rapidly when cobalt-60 declines away. Cobalt-60 has a half-life of five years. But the radionuclides that we looked at in 1976 were nickel-63, and nickel 59, and if you look at those, the radiation levels decline very slowly. And a year after we published this paper, uh, Robert Pohl at Cornell found niobium 94 also extremely important as a radioactive uh, uh, material. So it doesn't show very well, but this is a number of years. There's 120 years over here. Uh, and the total curies is just declining very slowly over time. So what can you do about this? There are two alternatives, as I mentioned before. One is to dismantle the reactor, take it all apart uh, fairly promptly. All the fuel has been taken out of the reactor now at San Onofre. It's sitting in fuel pools or it's sitting in dry casts uh, uh, on the site. So you can dismantle the reactor, uh, terminate the license. You still have the spent fuel sitting in casts. Um, 
However, you can't take all the fuel out of the fuel pool. It has to cool down sometime. Uh, it has to f cool down from five to 20 years, depending on the burnout, how much uh, electricity each fuel assembly has generated. When I looked at some of the reports, it said with the high burnout fuel, you have to let it cool down for 20 years before you can put it in these containers. So now we're talking about uh, 2033 when they finally get all the fuel into, into um, storage casts. So I don't know if, if maybe you can tell me, I don't know whether it's yet been stated what uh, SoCal wants to do at the reactor, whether they want to put it in safe store. Most utilities now want to put reactors in safe store and, and essentially walk. Maybe in question and answer you can tell me. Uh, this is uh, a reactor that I worked on, uh, Connecticut Yankee reactor in Connecticut, uh, where they've taken apart the entire reactor and this is what remains. Uh, 40 casts have fuel in them, and three casts over here on the side have these hotter components from the reactor itself. Uh, this is what I call the Stonehenge concept of, <laughs> of uh, waste storage. Very good. But this is what's being done at uh, San Onofre. In, which, in this case, the casts, I'll show another slide shortly, the casts sit horizontally uh, in the containers. And right now there are 40 uh, casts sitting on the site like that. Um, 22 from Psalms 1 and 18 from Psalms 2. Uh, and the estimate is there will be another 126 once they remove all the fuel and put it into these containers, and another 10 holding parts of the reactor, the hot parts of the reactor. So let me see, 40, 126, 166, 10, 176 modules like this. This is, what the, this is what is sitting inside uh, all of those modules, those concrete boxes. The fuel is slipped into uh, these slots, this lattice work. Well, first, this canister is put inside a transfer cask and it's put into the fuel pool itself. Then the fuel is inserted into the canister. The um, cover plate is put on. They pull, they pull the entire assembly and the transfer cask out of the pool and evacuate it uh, through those valves. And then they pump helium in, and then they sit to see whether the helium uh, does not have a high leak rate. And if everything goes all right, then they put another cover over the top and weld that as well. Then the entire assembly is pulled out. The assembly, this canister plus the transfer cask around it is pulled out of the pool, is pulled out of the building and brought over to the those modules. You can't just you know, put any fuel in, in any order. You have to make sure that the hottest fuel is on the outside, the fuel that's creating the most heat, and the cooler fuel is put on the inside. That's, I guess, obvious to you. Uh, the casts that they've used so far hold 24 fuel assemblies, though they're asking for permission for casts that hold 
for canisters that hold 32 fuel assemblies. Uh, they haven't been given permission yet, but this high burnout fuel is an issue uh, for these uh, canisters that hold 32 fuel assemblies. Then this entire system, the, the canister, is pushed out of the transfer cask into this concrete box. And then the entire system is cooled passively. Cool air comes in here, and cool air goes out the top. Hot air goes out the top, sorry. <laughs> cool air through the bottom, just like a chimney. So this is the fuel pool where the cask, the canister and the transfer cask are put. The fuel is put into it, and then it's taken out to the, once it's sealed up, it's taken out to the horizontal modules. And then the entire container is pushed into uh, the, the module itself. And there it sits. When it comes time to remove it at some future time, then they get the transfer cask, they pull the cask out, they pull the canister out into the transfer cask, and they move it all over to a transportation overpack. Okay, these are some of the issues uh, involved here. Uh, one is concerned about the total heat within these canisters. Uh, as I mentioned, you have to, you can't just put the hottest heat, you know, in the center of the cask. You put it on the outside. Uh, and some cool fuel has to be cooled down 20 years. Um, you can't just put any fuel in. The fuel actually has to have some burn up. You have to use up some of the uranium-235. You don't want a cast to go critical. You know, you want the reactor to do, is where uh, the criticality occurs. Um, so they have to put, in addition, they don't just have st stainless steel plates that separate the fuel. These are boral plates, it's plates that absorb neutrons that, have, that are uh, in the canister itself. Another issue involves this, these containers that hold 32 fuel uh, assemblies. Uh, there are 10 reactors in the country that have these uh, canisters that hold 32 fuel assemblies, but none of them have been licensed for fuel that is really hot. Well, here's a f my first cask that was developed. This is from my Italian slideshow. These are wine casks, cask 1.0. 1, 1 but this is the one that they use. Once, if, once they would transport it out of San Onofre to somewhere else, wherever that is, uh, they would put the canister inside this overpack, transportation overpack. And you see this picture shows it's on rail these casts are fairly heavy. You can't carry them on the highway. Uh, fortunately, the rail tra railroad tracks are close to the plant. Uh, you have um, lead, which shields the gamma radiation. You have uh, another layer of neutron absorbing material on the outside. You have impact limiters that impact the cask. If there's an accident and the impact limiters are involved, uh, it'll absorb some of the blow. And that would be taken to I don't know where. There is no place to take, there's no place to take the fuel right now. Uh, first, you have to get it over to the rail line uh, unless they build a rail spur into San Onofre, 
you'll have to carry it over and they did do this for the steam generators they had a heavy haul configuration similar to this which carried the steam generators and this shows how long it is two hundred and twenty feet this this extra truck in the back is called a pusher you know if it happens to be going over hills but you can see you can compare the length of this object to all these other objects you know a bus is thirty to forty feet long and this is two hundred and twenty feet and they travel very slowly multi wheel These are, the, these are the issues that I see. Uh, there's timing. Uh, there's a long cool down period for high burn up fuel. This fuel is, is fairly hot. Uh, usually, the hottest I've seen at other reactors is on the order of 60,000 megawatt days per metric ton, and this fuel is 67,000 megawatt days per metric ton. I, and as Arjun pointed out earlier, we don't know how they got permission to do that because it hasn't been analyzed. You know, uh, the issue of who pays is important. I, I looked over the uh, the amounts that are in the decommissioning fund, and they're quite it's they are quite large. Uh, most of the decommissioning that's taken place in this country, the costs are on the order of a billion dollars. Uh, generally, the amount that's been estimated is always uh, the amount that is actually paid is always higher than the amount that's been estimated. If you look at NRC estimates and compare it to the actual payment, uh, it's usually at least doubled. I know from Connecticut Yankee Reactor, uh, the estimated cost was on the order of 500 million, and it cost over a billion dollars to. Uh, finally take that reactor apart. Um, and in the case of uh, San Onofre, the decommissioning funds are quite large. Uh, my uh, reading is they will go on the, up to the order of $2 billion for each plant. And that's the um, amount that's already been put away. Um, What's a little confusing to me is the Department of Energy says that they are going to pay for the storage, you know, for all of the uh, removing fuel from the reactor and putting it into dry storage and eventually transporting it. And that comes to on the order of, for San Onofre, on the order of $350 billion for each reactor. Uh, yet, in um, proceedings before the Public Utility Commission, as far as I'm able to determine, uh, San Onofre isn't given a, a credit for what the Department of Energy is going to reimburse them for. So it's included in the decommissioning cost. Uh, perhaps somebody who's been involved in Public Utility Commission can straighten me out on this, but it looks uh, like double counting. Uh, whether San Onofre gets money from Mitsubishi, I, I don't know how that's going to turn out either. There have been, I read the newspaper headlines as much as you and the recriminations that are going back and forth. So I don't know how that's going to remain. What it, once the reactor is finally taken apart and the fuel is sitting there, then what? The fuel is sitting there till what till there's a place to take it um well in the interests of full disclosure i do work for the state of nevada and on nuclear transportation issues and at least as long as harry reed is there they probably the fuel is probably not going to go go to nevada um so I don't know what's going to happen. Are the utilities going to consolidate the fuel and put it into one location that's away from water? All reactors are near water. Um, put it into the desert somewhere? I just don't know. I, I can't tell as to what's going to happen next. Uh, 
it may sound a little strange to you, but the situation here is a lot better than it is in Vermont. Uh, in Vermont, we have what's called a merchant plant, a plant that has no ratepayers, uh, just sells electricity to other companies. And so we can't go after them to get any extra money, uh, unlike SoCal, which still still has still is soaking you for, uh, you know, for shutting down. Um, and so I don't I don't really know what's go what's going to happen here. Where in Vermont, we're trying to encourage the. Uh, the governor to take the site by eminent domain and order the company to clean it up. Uh, that is sort of a radical notion. Hopefully it will lead to some kind of negotiation. Uh, here, the Navy owns the site. Uh, and I'm not familiar with the full details of the agreement between the Navy and SoCal, but I think it's SoCal has to clean up the site to what it was, uh, you know, initially. That's all I have.